thank you all for turning out wherever you are in the world. And uh, thank you, Jess. And uh, thank you, Chan, who I believe is here in spirit, at least, and uh, members of the Science Circle for inviting me here today. I don't get in world much these days, but uh, the invitation to present to you today was a great draw to come back in. I've done several of these now uh, for the Science Circle, and I certainly love the enthusiasm and the insights I always find uh, in this circle of science fans and advocates. Uh, to our topic for the day, well, every day each of us tries to communicate with others. Sometimes we do it well, sometimes we don't. Communicating with our coworkers and our students and our family, and sometimes we're able to connect and it's hard to break through uh, people's natural barriers. We are exposed to some 3,000 marketing messages every day. We, we have to block out people. We have to block out their messages or we'd simply be overwhelmed uh, with input. So what we're going to do today is seek ways to boost our communication success, how to connect across barriers and our brain limitations. And I'm going to share some tips and tactics. My international students tell me work, uh, work across other languages as well, not just English. And we're not going to be dealing with grammar and spelling and punctuation and all that stuff. What we're looking are for some, some very successful ways that have been identified for connecting our messages across those barriers. And I've worked in uh, communications for most of my professional life, more than 40 years of it now. And currently I teach uh, communications and related courses at UCLA and UC Santa Barbara, uh, California Lutheran University, National University. And I've taught elsewhere in the United States and Eastern Europe, dealing with non-English speakers as well and facing those challenges. Uh, before I was a teacher, I was a reporter and news anchor for stations in the United States before becoming a chief for a TV bureau in Moscow. And once again, those challenges of connecting across languages and cultures. And I had jobs in print and radio and all of them involving very precise communication requirements and the ability to connect with a very diverse audience. And even before that, well, I spent a number of years in social services as a program director and a counselor and even a probation officer for a while. And what I found in each of these jobs as a teacher, as a reporter, as a social worker, that all of them required that we connect with people where they're at and then take them someplace new, hopefully. And it's the connecting that's the challenge, not to mention all the other barricades and denials that we put between us and others. And on top of that, our poor brains have to do it all on a very small power supply. In fact, professional communicators have to face this. We can only expect so much focus from our listeners, given that our human brain only runs on 12 watts of power, and that's less power than it takes to power a refrigerator light bulb. And this means we have to minimize our demands on our audience for their attention and their focus while seeking a maximum return for their minimized efforts on their part. And we do that by trying to reduce the brain energy drain. And we do that with brevity and simplicity and resonant messages. Perhaps you've seen this little guy. He's called the homunculus. And it shows what we would look like if our bodies represented how much of our brain power is allocated to each part of our body. Our senses take up much of our brain power, what we can touch and taste and express. Thus, if we want some of that limited 12 watts of brain power uh, our listener is expending, we want that focused on our message. Well, then we better present it in a way that our audience can best absorb and limit our demands on their limits. So let's start with a few simple tasks that you can take right now. And uh, one of the most useful tactics for maximizing communication is to write at an eighth grade level. 
And that's the average reading level of our general uh, population. And that's here in the United States. I imagine this is true around the world as well. You want to you wanna keep your writing simple. And this means uh, even top decision makers who may be speaking at a much higher level, graduate school, they're still going to appreciate it if you can express yourself clearly and simply so they can review your message and make a decision quickly, hopefully deciding to approve your goal. So for any eighth grade teachers here, I want to stress this doesn't mean writing like an eighth grader, but for an eighth grade level. And this means using one syllable words where possible and no more than three syllables. Don't write utilize when you can use use instead. And keep your sentences short, use bullet items where suitable, and keep your paragraph smaller, perhaps using four sentences instead of eight. And there's an article that uh, covers this topic more in depth on my UCLA supplementary website. I'm going to share a link with you uh, to that before we wrap up. I'm going to be sharing quite a few ma communication materials I use in my classes at UCLA. And I'm going to give you access to my UCLA website if you'd like to save one or two of these articles. And this is a good one right here. How to write at an eighth grade writing level. Uh, there's another useful uh, article and uh, video which talks about the first step in connecting with low watt brains to get their attention. And psychologists and sociologists and marketers have identified 12 fundamental appeals for winning attention quickly, simply, succinctly. And I could spend an hour just talking about these, but in a nutshell, uh, beautiful writing gets noticed yeah, once you have their attention, and that's first and foremost. First, we got to break through those barriers, tap into those 12 watts they're expending on everything else that's happening in their life, and bring their attention to our message. So one of the surest appeals is simply to holler out fire, danger, and we respond quickly, if not necessarily favorably to calls for safety and security tapping into Maslow's pyramid. We are first and foremost uh, focused on staying safe. And how about this? Hey, do you want some cool stuff? Well, that grabs your attention, and that's using the appeal of possessions. Or, hey, you don't want to stand out of something strange, do you? Well, that's an appeal to imitating others. Or, are you feeling bad today? Well, we can make you feel better. And that's an appeal to good health. As you can see, I'm clicking through the numbers here. Um, do you need a new love? Well, that's a real common appeal we see on cable channels these days for all the dating clubs and networks. Do you need someone to kiss and hug? And that's an effective appeal to sex drives. And we know here in Second Life that can be a very strong appeal. Or how about, wow, what in the world is that? Well, that gets somebody's attention, and that's an appeal to curiosity. And we're all drawn to something beautiful. Mike just pointed that out. Beautiful writing gets noticed. We have an innate attraction to beauty and, and just things that overwhelm us with the spectacular realities all about it, the beauty of everyday living. That's a strong appeal. Uh, we love to have fun and relax, and we all love to feel important. That's an appeal. Uh, use our product, use our service, because you're an important person, and you deserve to be treated that way. That's going to win their attention. And We love to love, not just the romantic love, but love for our pets, love for our children. If we can tap into that, that's going to win their attention. And uh, we also, we are prefer to avoid discomforts where we can, and that can be a strong appeal as well. So if you can simply and succinctly conform your message to one of these appeals, chances are much better that you might win the attention of a brain not already tuned in and dedicating a few watts to you. And as hard as it is, 
to win somebody's attention, once we have it, we have to be very careful that we don't upset or alienate our listeners. It was hard enough to get them in the first place. We don't want to chase them away. And this is an area of my research and uh, my publications, is how to create resonance in a room with a wide range of cultural backgrounds and different nationalities, as well as subcultures around categories of age, gender, income, political leanings, and things like that. And the research data says dissonance in a room can be triggered by missteps at humor or along with the dissonant topics of sex and religion and, of course, politics. So as we're going to be talking just a little bit here, how to connect your message across linguistics and cultural barriers, it makes me wonder if you could just tap in real quick. Let me see where you are in the world. If you can put it in your nearby chat. I know we got just down in Australia, over in Australia, at least over from my perspective here in uh, California, Southern Ohio, which is a uh, Hopefully enjoying some of the spring weather. Southwest Virginia, oh, we got uh, people all over the place. CB, you are uh, in Iowa, Illinois. Okay, well, we have a lot of diversity. That's cultural diversity right here uh, in the United States. And Widget, as you know, Northern California is a very different culture from here in Southern California, though we do appreciate all the nice water you send us. Hope you're getting a pretty good snowpack up there. Uh, anyway, let's talk a little bit more. We've got uh, some diversity here in the room. Uh, you may have attended my earlier uh, Science Circle presentation on transcultural themes that may well resonate across diverse groups and minimize the brain drain that we ask from our listeners. And we do that by crafting resonant messages that connect with diverse mindsets. And there's certain topics that appeal well and break through those barriers once again. And those topics are babies and children. If we can frame our message uh, around these topics, pets and animals and sports, uh, love conflicts, self-image, that's an interesting appeal, uh, the life cycle and water. And I'm not going to go into depth now on this. We've touched on this topic in my presentations before here, but I will share some links with you at the end uh, this morning, uh, today, this evening, wherever you are. Uh, and uh, that will let you know where you can find some uh, videos and articles detailing some of these uh, topics a little deeper. Uh, if you're getting these, uh, these uh, tactics so far apply both the spoken and written word. Just a little focus on uh, spoken presentations and how we win the attentions of uh, limited brains. Well, to accommodate those limitations, we need to keep our speaking speed right around 160 words a minute, somewhere between 140 and 180. And, you know, 160 words sounds pretty fast, doesn't it? But it's really, it's really not. And if you want to give it a try, you can take a screenshot maybe of uh, this text here on the side. It's 40 words. And if you were to read it at the proper uh, speaking speed, it would take you about 15 seconds. And that would mean you're at the right pace for best listener attention and retention. And, of course, we want to sl slow our speed down a little bit if we're trying to make greater impact. Listen, I'm going to speak slow. Or we can speed it up to convey a sense of urgency. This is an important speaking tactic. So I want to convey that I'm excited about it. And even though they may not be listening to the precise words, they can tell by our speaking speed what some of the intent is behind the message. And again, there's a video about this, uh, best speaking speed and other presentation tips. And I'll uh, give you a link so you can find out uh, more about that. Um, you may also want to uh, limit the demands on your own 
12 watt brain. We're talking about our listeners having very limited wattage. Well, we have the same limitation on our own brains. And so we want to limit the demands on our own brain when we're forced to speak on a topic, perhaps at a moment's notice. Uh, Day says she tried. Um, uh, 14.7 seconds. Well, that's just right on the mark. Congratulations. Good speed. Um, what we do is uh, life sometimes comes down to 60 seconds, doesn't it? Something is put right in front of us, a big choice. Maybe we're meeting somebody for the first time, and this is a relationship that we just know is going to go somewhere. We're asked a question at a job interview, or we step on an elevator and suddenly I had one of my students got on an elevator and there was Steven Spielberg and this student was in Los Angeles and as all LA students they're hoping to become working in entertainment or the movies someday and there was Steven Spielberg and this poor student was just tongue-tied couldn't think of anything to say so once again life comes down to a moment sometimes it's just 60 seconds or the time it takes to travel between floors on an elevator. And that's why these are called elevator speeches, because that's when you want to be prepared to do it. Maybe in a line at Starbucks or uh, grabbing a donut somewhere, and suddenly there's an opportunity presents itself for you to present your message in a way that connects. And are you prepared to grab it? So here are... A few topics that you should uh, be able to speak on in an instant if an opportunity is presented, if you're on a job search or you're conducting research. I know we have some researchers uh, in the science circle. Or maybe you're just at a job interview and you're asked about your personal interests or your life goals or your teaching philosophy. And your poor brain is just scrambling to come up with something worthwhile to say. Well, a lot of that simply comes down to preparation and thinking about this in advance. So I always advise that uh, a communicators keep a little succinct 30-second speech in their psychic pocket that they can pull out. And you're not going to be able to cover many points in 30 seconds. And you want to make sure that you keep a focus on their message. Tagline, 17.13 seconds. Slower is better than faster, that's for sure, especially if you're speaking uh, to a multilinguistic room. And uh, second, uh, second language people, I know it's so hard. I speak Russian. Unless they're speaking very, very slowly, I get lost. So 17 seconds wouldn't be too bad, especially if you're speaking to an international audience. So why you want to make sure you cover as you've achieved the proper speaking speed and you know you can hold their attention for about 30 seconds. In the United States in particular, Americans, we have a very limited attention span. We want you to get your message out quickly. Other cultures in Europe, possibly in Australia, they're a little more patient and they're going to give you a minute maybe more before their attention begins to waver. So make sure, especially if you're speaking with an American, with our limited attention span and possibly, I don't know, uh, if the wattage of brain power varies between cultures, but I wouldn't assume that our American culture <laughs> exceeds too many others in wattage. So make sure that you have your succinct talking points, uh, uh, who you are, and you should be able to cover that in about five seconds and what you've done, maybe another five seconds, and that's 10 seconds. You've got 26 more before their attention is going to waver. So the way you keep their focus on you is make sure those are remaining 20 seconds. Talk about what you have to offer your listener and most importantly, how you can help your listener. It should be mostly about them if you want to keep their attention. So go ahead, have a brief prepared presentation in your mental pocket, ready to go at just the right moment. And it can make all the difference in an effective communication and minimizing the demands on your own brain power uh, here's a simple uh, speech, a sample speech that I've used over and over and over, and then I modify it for the particular listener. Um, <laughs> 
Precambrian sex says that, that that's a pretty good way of getting the attention back to the class. So, you know, a lot of these tips, I know you've already experienced yourself, uh, especially of those of you who are teachers, you know exactly how hard it is to get the attention of a class, especially. <laughs> I'm glad you said this day, especially uh, our students who also have low watt brains and you know we may think that our brains as educators are so much superior to their brains but really they're not in fact their brains may even be firing a little better than ours those younger brains with their new neurons <laughs> they were thinking with their milliwatt brains that's tagline Anyway, here's an example of what I consider. Uh, it's, it's worked for me, a uh, successful uh, elevator speech, and then I modify it according to uh, whoever it is I'm speaking to. If I'm speaking to another educator, I may focus more on the university background or media people. I may focus more on my journalism background. But in general, go ahead, keep a good one-minute speech in your pocket and then modify it according to the circumstances, uh, keeping in mind that in America, and they're their uh, attention begins to waver after about 30 seconds. And once again, you can find uh, some more materials on this on my UCLA student webpage, and I'll be giving you a link for that. Uh, now, uh, I just I want to share with you, in fact, this was the original goal of this presentation. This is one of the most uh, well-received presentations that I make uh, in the course of the year. This is some of my all-time favorite writing tips, communication tips for connecting your message with the hearts and the minds of others, uh, however low watt they might be. And this is based on a writing program developed by the University of Chicago, uh, the Graduate School of Business. I was teaching this course to MBA students, and they'd say this was the most useful course in their MBA program because these are tactics you can use right now, practical techniques for a dramatic improvement in your communication skills. And this is normally a six-week course. Uh, my PhD is from UFC. Go Big Red. Well, glad to have you in the room. Do you recognize any of these faces? These are such typical professorial faces. Uh, my picture isn't in there because I didn't have a beard at the time. <laughs> I've since grown some fuzz, so I'm going to go ahead and add my picture uh, to this page as well. Anyway, this is a six-week course, but I'm going to give you the essence of it uh, in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes or so, and then we'll be wrapping. And once again, not a single writing suggestion here. Uh, mentions the words grammar, spelling, or punctuation, and my international students, whatever language they're speaking, I don't know, 30, 40 different languages I've had, at least in my class by now. They all say these tactics apply to their own language as well. Now, let me pause and also ask, is, is there anybody here that has a, a first language other than English? Or possibly uh, a, a second language. Go ahead and give me your second language, too. What kind of languages do we have in the room? This always fascinates me when I hear back from my students, too. German, good. Uh, it'd be interesting to hear as we work through these, and I'm going to be pausing periodically. You're going to see a question mark on the screen, which means a sample's going to follow. So if you want to jump on that uh, and propose your own sample, uh, feel free to do that. Let's go ahead. Let's start with our first tip here. And this is one of the best tips of all for, once again, grabbing that attention. And I can't stress this enough. If you don't, if you haven't won their attention, you know this is true. You might as well just shut up. So first and foremost, very limited brain power, very limited wattage that is open to your message. How are you going to break through the barrier and link on to that attention span. Well, tip one is go ahead, use resonant flesh and blood characters uh, in your communications rather than just boring old nouns. For example, if I was telling a bedtime story to a six-year-old girl, well, what kind of characters uh, would I be using? Well, perhaps ponies and unicorns or astrophysicists, whatever. 
uh, is interesting to that mind. That's what I'm going to be looking for. What kind of people are going to be most interesting to whoever it is that I'm talking to? Um. And that's what's going to hold their attention. And grown-ups are just the same. Grown-ups like stories and characters that connect. So if I was writing a grown-up memo about company management issues and how we're going to deal with these problems facing the company, well, my uh, <laughs> Neil deGrasse <laughs> on a pony, uh, CB, it's good to have you in the room. Uh, if I was writing a memo to uh, corporate officers, well, my characters would be managers and employees, people they can relate to, flesh and blood people that you can take to lunch, rather than using boring old nouns that alienate attention, like talking about infrastructure and completion dates and distribution routes. Well, nobody can relate to that. Nobody's going to take a distribution route to lunch. So for a university memo, if we're writing uh, uh, for our colleagues at school, well, we talk about teachers and students as characters rather than GPA and attendance rosters. And for sales-related writings, for example, if we work in sales, well, our customers would be uh, our characters would be customers and clients rather than talking about projections and uh commissions, for example. Well, here's an example. There you see, you got the little red question mark there. We're going to be seeing that. Feel free to type in your own. Here we're talking about uh, professional advancement. And professional advancement is achieved through hard work. Well, that says something there, but it's really not going to grab somebody's attention. And we have professional advancement, which is a rather abstract subject. It's not a good character. It doesn't live and breathe. We can't take it to lunch. So what might we use instead uh, in this instance? Well, I'm going to go ahead and stick with, with Tyson on a pony because that's just a funny image, and I know that would grab my attention. Uh, how about this? Managers achieve success through hard work. It's a relatable character, and it gives us something concrete to visualize. Your listener is going to appreciate it, that you've given them an, an image, another human being that actually uh, appeals to them. Here's tip number two, or in this particular class, we'd now be on week two. And then, well, you may think, well, how do you fill a whole week just talking about resonant characters? Well, what we would do is we would have the students write all different kinds of communication, business memos, dissertations, uh, love notes, whatever they're writing. And we're going to have them rewrite it in a way that brings resonant characters to the message specific to their uh, target audience. Well, then we would hit week two and say, okay, you did a good job on the characters. Now let's talk about action verbs. And we do like to visualize uh, as we read. So as writers, as communicators, we should use action words that propel our readers along. And that's our writing tip, too. We love to see verbs that power us visually from one place to another rather than just sit there. One of my favorite uh, resources on my website, my course site, by the way, are action verbs. It's got several hundred action verbs that apply uh, especially for like your resume. You're supposed to use good action verbs in your resume and your cover letter. And this is a roster just full of hundreds of good uh, action verbs relating to particular fields. You might want to take a look at that. Once again, I'll give, I'll give you the link coming up. So in this example, once again, there's the little red question mark there. If you can read ahead and want to input your own suggestion in the chat before I get there, I'm glad to see that happen. So in this wrong example, we have is as a verb, and that's one of the weakest verbs there is, isn't there? And then we also have the problem where memo isn't a very good character. We can't take a memo to lunch. So how might we revise this sentence with a more visual character and action that's going to appeal to those limited brains we're trying to connect with? 
Well, I don't see any uh, suggestions here. Let me show you what I got. Yours might be better. I'm sure you're thinking about one in your head right now. Uh, how about this one? The memo hits you right on. <laughs> uh, how about this one? The manager crafted the memo with resonant characters and strong verbs. Okay, it's it's clear, it's visual, it's engaging. Okay, now there's a few more words there, but nonetheless, those words serve a purpose, which is breaking through the barriers and connecting to a mind, which as the first example, the memo is written well, uh, just may not resonate and connect with our target audience. So if you need to use a few more words, but it impacts your effectiveness, your connecting, go ahead, throw those words in. But here's our tip number three, which is beware too many words between the subject and the action. Our week, our writing tip three, which would be week three in the class, and that's to perform uh, perform an eight word test. And that's where we keep our characters and our actions within eight words of each other, so our our listener can easily follow who is doing what. And that's the most immediate question your listener is going to have: Who is doing? what and the fewer words uh, between those two uh, whether it's the characters and the actions or the nouns and the verbs well that's all the better so we answer the question who is doing what with minimum brain drain for our reader and Mike Shaw is saying here yes uh, students make sentences so long they even forget to put the verb in sometimes or we we've heard that uh, the boss is, boss is out of the game today ooh that's a good one <laughs> uh, we, we we need to we need to make sure that our messages, and I'm real guilty of this. I'm doing it right now. If I lose my train of thought, so I begin to ramble, and hopefully the train comes back again. Well, at that point, it's too late. You've already lost their attention. You may as well just shut up. They may be still looking at you and nodding their head yes, but they're already thinking about what they're going to have for lunch or what movie they're going to go see this weekend. So, And that's certainly the case, I'm sure, Mike, with your students. <laughs> Perhaps they just, they hope if they speak long enough, something begins to make sense and you'll tell them good job. So here's an example right here on this slide uh, of how badly many people write and communicate. Uh, there's an ugly sentence right there. And again, especially if they're just not clear on what they want to say or uh, even worse, they're trying to hide something. That's something I learned as a journalist is if they're just rambling on and not really making a point, quite often it's intentional. They're trying to hide uh, the story that you might really be looking for. So here's a very ugly example, and look how far apart the uh, character is from the action here. The manager responsible for the daily assignments and worker allocation charts in our department is sick today. Well, there you go. There are some 13 words there between uh, the uh, character and the action, and by the time we finally get there, we've lost them. Well, the boss is out of the game today. Well, there's a, there's a message. It uh, leaves out some. That's another thing. The boss is goofing off. Uh, somebody seems to be angry with their boss. <laughs> Our scheduler can't be with us today. Okay, that that's really good because we are, uh, first of all, focusing on a character. I see boss. I see scheduler. Uh, and that's good. We're focused on flesh and blood characters. Also, we have to keep in mind as we're reworking these sentences, we can't leave stuff out. I mean, we have some things here we do have to talk about, which, for example, are the worker allocation charts. Uh, we can't overlook that. So let's look at one way to rewrite this sentence, hopefully keeping our meaning intact. Uh, our department manager called in sick today, so we are missing the daily uh, assignments. And it moves the character and the action right next to each other, and it's much easier to swallow and digest. Our department manager called in today. Um, it gives us a good character. It gives us somewhat of an action verb. We may come up with something a little better than called, but called is certainly better uh, than is. Why is is weak? Well, the person is. 
the animal is. Well, it implies they're existing, but the animal leaps or the person tap dances. It's just it's such a much more engaging uh, character. Sickness is stuck to that. <laughs> ah, this is a fun group. I wish uh, I wish we were sitting in a classroom together. Uh, this is the next best thing. I can uh, somewhat see the backs of your heads anyway. It's much better if I can see the front of your faces. Uh, keep the main complimentary phrase is sit close to the sentence. Now oh, look at all those grammar to, uh, terms there. Uh, yes. <laughs> I imagine this is being said tongue in cheek. <laughs> Unfortunately, and you know this is true. This is how too many business communications are written, academic communications, papers, using this language. And I don't know why. Trying to uh, impress people. I don't know what it is. Uh, unfortunately, you may have impressed them, but you haven't communicated with them. And that's what this topic is all about. How to connect. How to actually mind meld with somebody. Have a, have a meeting of hearts. And that's what we're trying to accomplish here. <laughs> yeah, you have a, uh, a, a particular problem when you're dealing in academics uh, sessions. And here we have chemists uh, today once again sharing some of the complicated communications. And, you know, there's no way getting around it. Sometimes our messages have to be complex, but we can still take that complexity and phrase it in terms that uh, break through the mind. One of those is, of course, using uh, resonant characters. Another is using engaging verbs and keeping your characters and verbs very close to each other, no more than eight words apart. Um, that's halfway through the class. Congratulations. You've just achieved uh, midterm on a six-week class talking about six tips. Here's tip number four, and this is a real uh, important one, and that is to link complex sentences. we got to use them, uh, especially in scientific settings, uh, and we've got to use certain phrases which aren't necessarily pretty, but what we can do is we can at least connect them. We can link them to help our reader navigate through the text. And that's what we want to do. We want to take our listener gently by the hand and lead them through uh, the content of our message. And we do that using connecting words. What are some good connecting words? Do you know what I mean when I talk about explicit connectors? It's just connecting words that explicitly let people know that this is connected to that. Therefore is a good one. I use that one quite a bit. Therefore, or hence, if we want to get a little more archaic, these are connecting words. For example, thus. So, yeah, look at all these good connecting words. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Because of this, henceforth, all those good words. Um, so here's another example uh, on the screen right here. Uh, I like so. Yeah, I like short words, too. But it also it connects. And I mean, it's, and is probably one of the most frequently used. I'm sure it is one of the most frequently used words in the English language. And I think that's true for most languages of the world. We use these connecting words. Um, so here's an example. Uh, the manager didn't treat the workers well. Workers were poorly motivated and often quit. Now, we may assume that these uh, two sentences are directly related to each other, but what we have to do is we have to stop and pause and wonder, uh, and just to make sure, are these two sentences are indeed linked? And if we're asking our reader to stop, make that pause, they're going to be expending some of that precious brain power trying to figure it out. And that's, that's brain power we want to keep focused on us, not on deciphering a message. So once again, we're trying to take our readers by the hand, walk them through our text with minimum effort on their part. Uh, and I'm already seeing a word here, I believe so. Workers were poorly motivated and often quit in just that one short word. Uh, Emily Lola. Emily Lola? Am I saying Emily? Emily Lola? It's a great name. Um, imagine the change in meaning, thinking it with though. Well, there you go. 
Uh, and that provides some contrast. That provides some contrast, and that's good as well. And still what we're doing is helping our listener know that our, our thoughts are connected here uh, with minimum effort on their part. Uh, what did I throw in there as a word? Because of that, workers suffered from poor motivation and often quit. By just inserting this connector, well, look, we've, we've removed the doubt that managers' mistreatment of the workers caused them to quit, and even a thick-headed manager uh, might get the point and be a little bit nicer to the workers. We are now coming up on the end of our six-week course with tip number five, and what this tip considers is how reluctant people are to learn something new or modify their behavior. And that's just human nature. We're basically lazy by nature. And possibly, I would say, there's even a survival value to it that we hesitate to change because change quite often may lead us to someplace disastrous. So we lock ourselves into the systems that we know already work, and that's just human nature. So rather than hitting them with something new right off the top and getting that knee-jerk reflex of, oh, no, not something new, well, let's first of all establish a comfort level, a common ground, and as we lead our listeners, our readers from old information, comfortable territory to the new information, second. So we establish our common ground and we gently nudge them along. Uh, and in this first example here, we see, well, we're starting off just the opposite. We're some, starting with something new, new formula, new steps, modifying our old procedure and just giving a passive glance to that familiar territory as we go by. That's just the opposite of what we want to do in this tip. So what might we do? Well, let me make sure, first of all, I haven't seen an answer come through here yet. I hope I haven't lost your attention. Your uh, limited wattage here, it's, uh, well, still morning here in uh, California. To modify our old, we will mix the new. Well, that's exactly what we're looking for, starting with the old territory. Um, and let's see if we can make it even a little more comfortable, a little more familiar. Um, we're just going to flip the sentence order around. We're going to set some comfortable common ground by talking about our existing protocol. Our existing protocol calls for mixing formulas with established procedures. Everybody's going to be nodding their head yes, even though they know it. And you may think it's insulting and demeaning to tell them something they already know. Well, they love to hear it because it makes them feel empowered. It makes them feel in control. And that's where you want your starting ground to be, is respecting where they're already at and making them feel comfortable and solid. And then they're gonna they're gonna turn their attention to you a little more because you've made them feel good. And that's when you can bring in the new information that we're improving our old ways with some new steps. And they've had a chance to welcome it before that new information barges in. And I'm sure you can all relate to this. We all prefer to, to feel like we're in control and we already know something rather than getting hit with something we don't know, which, of course, I suffer that every day. There's so many things I don't know. But if it can be presented just a little gentler, uh, respecting what I already do know, well, chances are you're going to win my attention at least. And then here is our final tip. Uh, it's one of the most common writing complaints I hear from my students, uh, the teachers in the room. I sure, I'm sure you know that's true as well. I just don't know where to begin. I don't know how to uh, formulate my ideas. I don't know what architecture to use to present these ideas. And there in front of them sits this blank page and a blinking cursor over and over, blinking and just mocking the fact that you don't know what to say. So here's a really simple paradigm architecture to use. We're going to start simply with a problem statement. We, we're losing valuable workers here. That's a common problem at a lot of job sites. You're going to have the attention of your boss, your decision maker. We have a problem. We're losing workers. And then 
don't forget to pose the solution. There's too many workers that just come up to their boss. We got another problem. We got a problem here. They feel powerful because they've got the boss's attention and they're bringing you a problem and they're feeling that I am making a contribution. But I can tell you this as a manager uh, myself in the past, I hate those kinds of workers. I'm sure you know the ones. Oh, we got another problem and that's their claim to power. So make sure that if you're presenting your decision maker with a problem, you also pose a solution. Well, here's our problem. We're losing valuable workers, but here's a possible solution. Let's create a worker retention program, which still isn't enough. It's better than having no solution at all, but we have to make sure that it's a workable solution and that can be put into action steps. So we want to make sure that along with the problem, along with the solution that we present, that we also have an action plan. So let's bring in a consultant, uh, which is, you know, typical. If there's a, a, an internal problem, if there was somebody inside that knew the answer, it would already be fixed. So quite often the, the call to action is, well, let's bring in somebody from the outside, maybe with a fresh perspective or sp particular expertise in this problem that can solve it. So once you do this, well, it begins to write itself, doesn't it? It's a very short, effective way of writing. We have a problem, but don't leave it at that. And here's a solution. That's something your boss is going to want to hear. And then let's take it just a step further. And here's the action we should take to implement the fix. You've presented an entire message, an entire uh, possible program, the problem, the solution, the action. And you've done that in a way less than 30 seconds even that maximizes your contact with that 12-watt brain. And bosses in particular tend to be on the lower side of wattage is my experience. So try this paradigm. Once you use it, your memo will start to write itself. In fact, your master's thesis, your dissertation starts with a problem statement, doesn't it? We have a problem. Here's the solution, and here are the steps we need to implement that solution. And next thing you know, your 150-page dissertation begins to fall into place. Isn't that a cool little tip? So here they are. These are the six top communication tips for maximizing your impact on limited attention span, low-watt brains, Use resonant characters that they can relate to. Engage action verbs that they can visualize. Use the eight-word test, keeping your characters and your actions close together. Use explicit connectors, leading your listener through your message. Uh, also, use old information for comfort, comfortable, familiar ground as you bring them to new territory. And then finally, use the problem-solution-action paradigm to help frame your message. And here's one of the most common types of communication problems I see. It just rambles on. If there is a clear point in here, I've put this on the screen, and the students can't even agree what the point is of this message, let alone what they should do about it. Uh, we could read this message over and over again and still not be sure what they're trying to say and have little to show up for it, but, you know, exhaustion at the end of the message. So here's an example of how these business writing tips can take an ugly piece of communication, revise it and transform it into an effective message that connects with the uh, low watt attention span of your listener. So let's look at how this is done. And we're going to uh, point out a few of the uh, steps that we're implementing here. Well, first of all, we start out with common ground. Our company's su success is important to us all. Nobody's going to object to that. They're feeling comfortable. They're nodding their heads. Yes, you've got their attention for a little bit longer. And then we're going to use that connector. Unfortunately, which also foreshadows, well, here's some bad news coming, and we're gently leading them through the message. Unfortunately, we have a costly turnover of valuable workers, and there's uh, some good characters in there, uh, workers are in there, and then we get to our managers. Um, 
connecting us to uh, an action plan. And suddenly this writing begins to make sense, doesn't it? It communicates a message, it resolves a problem, and you win lots of accolades for uh, your keen insight, your analysis, your problem solving, and most of all, your writing skills. And here it is right here once again. Uh, a lot of my students, they actually, they put this right on their computer monitors and they refer back to this. And I do know when I actually dig in and apply these tips myself, my communications come across so much better. The writing is so much easier to do. Uh, and most importantly, uh, you are a much more effective communicator uh, with your target audience. So give these tips a try next time you're writing an email or a memo. And uh, or a grant proposal, would you? You bet, uh, Mike. Uh, managers, yeah, of course, uh, need training, <laughs> considerable training. Uh, quite often, in my experience, managers rise up into their positions because they weren't able to do anything else. They couldn't perform the work, so let's make them a manager. Um, uh, and uh, you'll also find uh, that, uh, and I'll be giving you the link in just a moment. We're about done here. Uh, I'll be giving you a link where you can find the video on this and also a nice little article and a, a little tip sheet you can print out <clears throat> that looks just like this. Um, when I do teach communication classes, uh, mostly that's what I teach is some form of communication class. And I often refer to a quote by my favorite Russian writer, uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky, that if people will not pay attention to you, beg their forgiveness, for in truth, you are to blame. Give them a reason to listen. Make sure your intentions focus on the listener and how you might make their lives better. And... Uh, if they'll only share a few watts of their brain power with you, assure them to just give me a little bit of your attention and I'm going to leave you better for it. And if you fail on that mission, well, as Fyodor says, well, then you need to beg their forgiveness. Don't blame them. Uh, and I hear this, you know, I've worked in, in journalism for a lot of years and they're very upset that my story really didn't connect with people. What are they stupid? Can't they see how important this is or connecting with students? Listen up students. This is so important. And then they blame the students for not paying attention. Well, Fyodor says beg their forgiveness because you're the one to blame for that. And I also have this lovely quote I love from uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. It just horrifies me that my uh, freshmen and junior students these days, the sophomores, they've never, uh, they've never read Uncle Tom's Cabin. They've never heard of Harriet Beecher Stowe. I guess we're just not teaching literature or requiring literature in our classrooms anymore. Anyway, she talks about a sympathetic influence that encircles every being and we touch other people simply by being and not necessarily having to do anything and that's a very direct way of connecting with hearts and minds let's eliminate words altogether and simply be something uh, that resonates and connects and that that method really appeals to a lazy guy such as me that i can just shut up and be uh, and possibly have some influence and uh, finally, as promised, well, here they are. Uh, here are the links. Uh, that's to my UCLA website. It's full of articles and videos and references. It's not a commercial website. I'm not making any money off of this. These are just some of the most valuable learning resources over the 15 years that I've been teaching uh, for the University of California. I eliminate the bad ones if they're no longer working and bring in some good ones if I find a new resource. And you're certainly welcome to access those, ucla.wwmr.us. Um, you can also check out my YouTube channel, uh, lots of educational videos there that I use for students, these communication topics, appeals, and even the best business writing tips uh, is reduced to a 10-minute video. You're welcome to uh, use that. Uh, and also some of the research on uh, transcultural communications, my journal articles. That is my particular background is just trying to connect across cultures and international settings. Uh, you might find some interesting work there if that's something you do as well. Uh, it's a topic never too far away from me. And also you can see the little eye there on the uh, bottom uh, of my uh, slide. 
uh, presenter here, there's a little I. If you click on that, that'll give you some contact information. Uh, and again, some of the links here to these resources. I got my email in there. Uh, feel free to zap me any questions or comments or recommendations you might have on this topic. Hey, I want to thank you for coming today. That's all I got to say before I poof away. Uh, let's see if there's any final comments or questions that may be uh, here. I don't see this slideshow on the UCL. Now, this particular uh, widget, this particular uh, presentation, I just uh, put together over the over the last couple of days. It hasn't been posted yet. Uh, if you do send me an email, I'll be glad to send you the slides from this as a PDF file. And I'll also be posting this in the next day or two on my website as I do after a presentation. I want to thank you all. Thank you for the comments. Uh, and uh, Jess, even if this isn't uh, being, re oh, it is being recorded. Wonderful. Uh, almost every topic that we covered in here from the uh, elevator speech to the proper speaking speed to the fundamental appeals for winning people's attention. I've got all those resources posted on my website and you're welcome to those. Well, that brings us up right on the hour. I believe these presentations typically go anywhere between 30 minutes to an hour. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, thank you, uh, Jess. My pleasure to be here. All my best wishes to Chan. I hope she's feeling well. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all again in some future platform on some future dimension. Until then, you all take care, and we'll catch you again. Am I, am I coming through? Uh, Jess, I'm going to go ahead and leave uh, this slide here. You can uh, keep it here as long as uh, you can, uh, and I'll set it up for open access. I'll unlock it so anybody who just wants to click through the slides are welcome to do that too. Thank you, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you are.